Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here today. I really appreciate your willingness to come and answer all our questions. I'm going to try to get through Basel III as well as some QE questions, and we'll see how my time goes. The first thing I want to talk about is following up on the questions Mr. Hurt asked, and you, I'll try to quote you, said that Basel III was not primarily aimed at community banks, and it's clear that it is aimed at the larger financial institutions who helped create the financial crisis. And I agree with you that it won't result in most community banks having to raise capital because their capital is normally higher. But for a few community banks that don't have capital right now where they are, they have not as much access to the capital markets, it actually could harm them. And none of these banks are going to be too big to fail. Nobody is going to come in and bail them out. They also aren't so interconnected. And I'm just curious why, given that Basel III is voluntarily compliant internationally, why we didn't just exempt out the community banks? Well, I think it's important that they be well capitalized, both to protect the insurance fund, to protect their local communities and the borrowers that depend on them. And we've seen in the past, we've seen financial crises that were small firms, like in the Depression and the savings and loan crisis. So I think they do need to have capital. But on this issue that you mentioned, we are giving very long transitions. We're not saying you have to have this level of capital tomorrow. And so banks can, you know, raise capital through retained earnings and through other mechanisms as well. Right. Well, and I appreciate that. And I don't think it's a burden on most community banks, but I do worry about a few of them. And I think it could result in consolidation in the industry and less community banks that serve some of our rural areas. And that troubles me a little bit. No, I agree with that concern. The second thing I want to recognize in your Basel III is that you, I think, appropriately recognize that activity, for example, international activity, increases systemic risk. But I was a little troubled that you continue to use artificial asset numbers. You know, I'm from Ohio. We have a lot of regional banks that serve the middle market that are either based in Ohio or have a major presence in Ohio. And, you know, you use the $10 billion number at the very bottom for the smallest banks, the $50 billion up to $250 billion. And if you look at sort of the size of all the 50 largest banks in America, there's really, there are kind of some tiers. There's the top banks above $2 trillion, and there's three of those, I think. I'm sorry, two of those. There's two more above a trillion, between a trillion and two trillion. And then there's three more above half a trillion dollars. But then it falls way off to $350. And you set that top limit for regional banks at $250. And there are banks that are regional banks that are essentially super community banks that are above that $250 to $350. A couple of them have a major presence in Ohio and serve our middle market. And I guess I would ask where you picked that artificial number of $250, because most people recognize both PNC and U.S. Bank as regional banks. Well, we've met with middle market banks and tried to understand their concerns. The basic philosophy here is that both the capital requirements and the supervisory requirements are gradated with size. So, for example, the largest banks will have capital surcharges, for example. Where we have failed to gradate appropriately, of course, we can go back and try to figure out how to get it right. And I appreciate that. And I would really urge you to take a look at the major cliffs in our asset sizes, because they really do, they spell themselves out. And I think the big jump between, say, $350 and $500, there's no banks between $350 million and $500 million. There's two, but there's two at three, just above $350, and then there's nobody until you get to almost $550. So, I mean, that's a big jump, and I think I'd urge you to take a look at that. And the only, the last question I'd like to quickly ask is about, you talked about stress testing a lot for the banks, and in your QE, and the way you judge your QE portfolio, would you be willing to, you know, submit the Federal Reserve's QE to the same kind of stress testing under the same kind of provisions you provide for these banks of potential interest rate spikes and inflation? Well, the stress test has a different purpose for the Fed, which is to affect how much remittances we send to the Treasury. And we have done various stress tests of that respect, and many of them are publicly available. We have a number of research papers, and there are also outside researchers, the IMF and others, who have done these tests. And the bottom line is that for any reasonable interest rate path, 
Um, this is going to end up being a profitable policy.